Hey everybody, so we're going to start with uh, chapter one, section three. So we're going to be going over scientific methods right now. Um, make sure you've got your workbook or your notes out and we'll get started. All right, so at this point, I'm going to share my screen with you. And we're gonna get started over what in the world are scientific methods. So with this whole coronavirus thing, we're kind of in the middle of a very interesting time. You are watching scientific method play out in real time. As we go over these things throughout this year, you're going to see, okay, so this discovery led to this and this discovery led to this. And now we know all of this. If you have been paying any attention to the news, you'll see that that's not the way it happens. It's not rapid fire. It's not very quick. Sometimes there's a lot of questions left unanswered for a long period of time. And that's because the scientific method takes a while and it builds on other research and it builds on um, communication with other scientists. So this is kind of a big deal. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to be sure that you have um, written down 1.3 scientific methods. If you're taking notes, if you're in your workbook, you're on the proper page and I'll get you that page in just a second. And I want you to be sure that you um, have your book open to page 12 or your ebook open to page 12. So this section starts on page eight and I highly recommend before you even listen to the rest of this lesson, you go through and you at least do the skim part and just to kind of do your pre-thinking and you do your vocabulary section. Those two are kind of the big ones, but get that done before you, we talk about the section so that you kind of have an understanding of what these are and you're not scrambling to write down definitions. So those two parts are always first. The other thing that I highly recommend that you do is that you um, be ready to pause me at any point so you can catch up with what I've written but know that not everything that I talk about or that is in these slides is going to be in the workbook. Okay, sometimes this stuff's a little difficult and it's, it's more for me to see that you're interacting with the material than it is for me to really see, oh my gosh, they know everything. So um, go ahead and have that ready. And if you wanna pause me now and do the skim and vocabulary, do that. But again, I highly recommend you do that before I start each lesson, okay? So we're on page 12, and here's our main idea for this section. The main idea says that scientists use scientific methods to systematically pose and test solutions to questions and assess the results of the tests. So here, we're going to use the same type of methods, and it's going to be a stepwise process. So we're gonna pose questions and test the solutions to those questions. Then we're going to assess the results that we get from that testing. So based on what I've talked about, just jot down over in the margin on your note, uh, workbook or in your notes, what do you know right now about scientific method? What do you want to find out? And then we'll come back and hopefully you can add something to the what I learned section. Here's what we're trying to answer during um, this lesson. What are the common steps of the scientific method? What are the similarities and differences between qualitative data and quantitative data? That's part of your vocab, so you'll, you'll go over that. In an experiment, which variable is independent, which is dependent, and which are controls? And what is the difference between a scientific theory and a scientific law? These are all really big concepts that you need to know this year. Um, I'll be testing you on these essential questions, so be sure you're paying attention for this part. Review, systematic approach, and you're going, I don't know that I know that. So I'm looking in the textbook on page 12, and it says a systematic approach is an organized method of solving a problem. So you may not think about it, but you do this daily, okay? Our new vocabulary, take a gander, that's a lot of definitions. Um, and you'll find them in the text and you can find them in the glossary, whichever way you want. I prefer them in the text because it makes more sense, but that's up to you. All right, so here's our first one. Again, if I move too fast, push pause. I just try to keep these videos short. As the scientific method is a systematic approach used in scientific study, whether it's chemistry, physics, biology, or another science. 
here we go. It is an organized process used by scientists to do research and provides methods for scientists to verify the work of others. In previous years and in previous textbooks, we have always had it in this very stepwise fashion. It would say observation, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, and that was usually it, usually communicate after that. But that's not accurate. So if you'll take a gander at this, I don't know why I'm using that word so often, but you'll be all right. We do start with observations or questions. So either I noticed blah, 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 or I am picking up that blah, blah, blah. So maybe you've already done some research and it leads to new questions. Or I have a question, why does this do this? And then that'll lead you to your hypothesis. That isn't an educated guess. We have said that for so long and it's really a disservice to the word. A hypothesis is a testable statement. That's exactly what it says, a testable statement or a prediction about what's going to happen. So guys, you can make a hypothesis all day long. Then once you test it, you either make sure it's correct or you have to revise it because it wasn't correct. And that's very normal. Sometimes we don't necessarily figure out what we want the first time around. So we have to keep trying to repeat it and alter our experiments to get better information. So this really is now have becoming more of a cycle. So we have, to, we have to understand that it's not going to work straight through. So when your hypothesis is made, then you start experimenting. You get the conclusions from that experiment. And sometimes you have to revise that hypothesis and start over. So once you revise, you start back at experiments, get your conclusions. And if it tested, you know, you got what you wanted, then you'll move on and try to come up with a theory. And a theory is a hypothesis supported by many experiments. So that hypothesis that you're working from, that testable statement, um, if I do this, this will happen, that can become a theory. So it's been, it's been supported, it's been proven, it's uh, testability is high, so I can get the same results over and over again. It's consistent. And then I consider, I, sorry, I continue to experiment, and I might have to revise that theory if it doesn't work, but then I might come up with a law. So that's a summary of accepted facts of nature coming from your hypothesis. So a theory is the hypothesis supported by experiments, but the law is a summary of facts. So be, uh, be clear, there, there are some big differences there. Okay, so um, like we said before, the steps are repeated until a hypothesis is either supported or discarded. So you can't just kind of get one, find that your results are wrong and be like, oh, well, we'll just stick with that. That is manipulating data and science is all about what can be proven with data. Okay, so we don't sit here and play with a, what do I think it is? No, I have to prove whether something is true or not, and I have to have the, the data to back that up. So we've kind of discussed this. Take a few minutes, and I highly suggest that you jot this down. It may or may not be in your workbook. Um, let's go look. It is not in your workbook. So please take a minute at some, uh, either in the margin or on a sheet of paper, jot this down, or you can put it in your OneNote because we're going to be using, uh, we've already used our OneNote, um, some of us, and some of us haven't, but I'll show you how to get to that in another video. Okay, so let's go a little more in depth here. An observation is the act of gathering information. So you have two types of data here, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative talks about the quality of something. Quantitative talks about the quantities associated with that something. Qualitative data is obtained through observations that describe color, smell, shape, or some other physical characteristic that is related to the five senses. So these have to do with senses. This is nothing we can quantify. This is my shirt is gray. This is my hair is brown. This is I'm medium height. There's no numbers attached to it. But if I have quantitative data, it's obtained from numerical observations that describe how much or how little, how big or how fast. I drove 70 miles per hour on the way to work this morning. Don't worry, that's the speed limit. Um, what else? I am five feet, four inches tall, supposedly. So those are quantitative data points about me and my day. 
So if you stop and think about all the stuff, if you look around you, you could take the mass of objects, you could look at the volume of certain objects, you could um, check your speed, how quickly do you run, how fast do you throw a baseball, those types of ideas. Those are all quantitative, while the qualitative might be like, it's a nice day outside. Um, the grass is green. Those are qualitative data points. So remember from section one, scientists observed that there were CFCs in the atmosphere and that their levels were increasing. And that becomes the point of why? I wonder why? So the hypothesis is that tentative explanation that I'm going to test. So here we see that the scientists hypothesize that the CFCs, although stable, normally break down in the stratosphere due to the interactions with that UV light from the sun and that the chlorine produced by this interaction will break down the ozone. So what I showed you earlier where the UV light hits the O2 molecules and it splits, that's a very simplified version of it. There are actually intermediate steps that show you what the chlorine does to the O2, but we'll skip that for right now. So we have a observation. CFCs, levels are increasing, hypothesis, they break down due to that UV light. The experiment, how can I control this to determine if I'm right? Is it the CFCs causing the ozone to break down? And an experiment is a set of controlled observations that test the hypothesis. So, um, a variable, you guys, you've been through algebra classes, you've been through science before where we've talked about variable. So it's a quantity or condition that can have more than one value. So it stands in for something. So an independent variable is the variable you plan to change. So independent starts with the letter I. So I plan to change the amount of CFCs in this container. I need to see what happens to this balloon when I heat it up. So I plan to change the temperature. Whatever I manipulate, whatever I change is independent. What we're looking for is dependent. So look at this definition. The dependent variable is the variable that changes. I did not mean to do that. The dependent variable is the variable that changes in value in response to the change in the independent variable. So I've manipulated the amount of CFCs. We're looking to see what happens to the ozone. So what happens to those O3 molecules in the air? Sorry, O2 molecules in the air. Now, when I'm talking about the balloon and the heating it up, I am heating it up so temperature is independent and I'm looking to see the change in the size. What does it do to that size of the balloon? So the volume there is the dependent. I'm watching the volume because I'm manipulating the temperature. So there you can see what, what am I affecting versus what, what happens as a result of my actions. So take a look at this example. If you're trying to determine if temperature affects bacterial growth, you would expose different petri dishes of the same bacteria, we'll get to that in a minute, to different temperatures. So everything needs to be the same, except you're going to have some of them in warmer situations and some of them in cooler. So I'm manipulating the temperature, so that's independent. Watching for the growth is dependent. And if you didn't already know this, guys, the cooler things are, the more hindrance there is for bacteria growth. That's why we refrigerate things. If we can keep things cooler, the amount of bacteria that can grow is less. And we'll talk about the correlations here in a bit. Okay, I told you it has to be the same bacteria. Everything else has to be the same. They are, that type of bacteria is your control. It's a standard for comparison in the experiment. So I don't want to change a bunch of things. I only want two things to change. I want to control everything else. So the two things with that bacteria and, uh, analogy would be, I want to see bacteria growth. That's the change I'm looking for. That's dependent because I'm changing temperature. So those are my two things. You only want two things to change. You're independent and dependent. So everything else needs to stay the same. Here's a little snippet. During clinical drug trials, physicians will use a double blind study. 
they will use two statistically identical groups of patients. So that's what we call normalizing the group. One will receive the drug and one will receive a placebo. Neither patient nor physician, that should say nor, will know which group receives the drug. Double blind, patients don't know, physicians don't know. That prevents bias, okay? So if I don't know that I gave them placebo, I'm still going to analyze the data the same way. That's extremely important in medicine and that's really important for if you're looking for qualitative data versus quantitative because qualities, your bias can sneak in and you might be looking for certain things more often. So in this scenario here, the group that receives the placebo is the control group. What would happen to their hair growth if I didn't give them the actual drug? How much would it change normally? Versus if I give them the drug, what does it do to their hair growth as compared to the control. So there are two different things here. You have a control group and you have control variables. Control variables are the things that need to stay the same in the experiment. And the control group is where I'm not putting it through the same rigors of the experiment. I'm just kind of leaving it alone. I just want to see a baseline. So for my um, Let's go back to the balloon analogy. For my balloon analogy, what happens when I change the temperature? Well, what happens if I leave the balloon alone? Clearly, I know what's going to happen, and you know what's going to happen, but we want to have a control so that we can measure, okay, at control or at my baseline, this is what it looks like with no intervention. But as I changed it, what happened there? So the next little bit that you need to know about um, experimentation is a conclusion. This is a judgment based on the information obtained from the experiment. A hypothesis is never proven. It's only supported by your data or it's discarded because it doesn't support your data. And you find a new hypothesis and move forward. So that's where we get to theories where it's like it's never proven. True, it can only be disproven. Okay, so that, that's kind of hard to explain to a lot of people, but just keep in mind based on what we know now, we know that this theory is true because all the evidence points that it is true. If I find a piece of evidence that proves it's not true, that theory is no longer valid. You have to revise it and work backward. All right, so what I want you to do, you're gonna pause this video here in a minute and you're gonna go to back to Clever. You're gonna click on McGraw-Hill. You're gonna click on your textbook, click on menu and homework again. And I want you to do the second um, assignment in there, and it's the ozone depletion video. Please watch that, and I'll give you question, uh, a question over it here in just a minute, and then we'll move forward. Okay, pause the video now. This is the fun part, guys. The theory that we may or may not come up with is an explanation that has been repeatedly supported by many experiments. I can't just do one experiment and say, this is it. And it'll always state a broad principle of nature that has been supported over time by repeated testing. Theories are successful if they can be used to make predictions. So theories are kind of, how does it work? How does, how, how did we get to our theory of evolution. Well, how did, how did humankind get here? How did all of the um, species that we see in the universe, in our universe, how did they come to be? So that, that theory has been built up over many years and many studies. If it can be used to make a prediction, it is successful. So this is where we start to talk about genetic mutations and things like that. How does it change the, the species we see now into the species we'll see in 200, 300 years. And a law, a scientific law, is a relationship in nature supported by experiments, and there are no exceptions found. A law would be like the law of gravity. If I throw something up in the air, it will, hopefully you said come down. It'll come down because we have the law of gravity because the theory of gravity has been proven so many times that I can say, okay, I know 
that if I throw an object up into the air, it's going to come back down because of, and then you go into the theory, why does it work? So a law dictates a relationship, if, then, and a theory explains why, based on all of the evidence provided previously. All right, so I'm gonna ask you these, what are the common steps of the scientific method? What are the similarities and differences between qualitative and quantitative data? In an experiment, which variable is independent, which is dependent, and which are controls? And what is the difference between a scientific theory and a scientific law? So you're gonna answer these questions for me and be sure that if you have any questions, you let me know. You can ask me um, via email, via remind, any of those, ask me whatever you need. All right. And that's the end of this lesson.